Thank you, sir, very much. And thank you to the city of Malibu for having us on this uh, Zoom. It's very important. And we wanted to get some of the uh, information out on just some fire season outlook and what the uh, rest of the 2023 um, year looks like. So with that, I'm Assistant Fire Chief Drew Smith. I'm responsible for the Santa Monica Mountains, which LA County is the protectors for with our fire organization. And so with that, one of my other hats that I play is um, I'm also the department's fire behavior analyst. Um, so with that, just looking at uh, the intelligence that we have. So your Los Angeles County Fire Department is a significant contributor to wildland fire management. This is also in response to the operation side on how we combat fires and also on the outlooks on what we do with our uh, subject matter experts and those around the county and the state and the nation for that matter on what the uh, relative risk is. So just focusing on Los Angeles County, the potential for this rest of the year is temperatures below normal through December. And remember those temperatures below normal can range three to five degrees only. But once again, we're focused most likely to have some days that uh, could be well above normal, but on average we're saying temperatures below normal through December. Talking about above average- um, I'm gonna turn it right off. Um, above normal precipitation, excuse me. Yeah, sounds good. We're at a working fire station. Apologize for that. Above normal precipitation, and I'll start talking about precipitation. Los Angeles County, on average, we average through a rainfall year approximately 15 inches. This year, we've had anywhere ranging from 30 to 40 inches of rain, so we're double the amount of rain that we've had through the rainfall year. And so, trending towards above average precipitation going into the winter months and then uh, into the 2024 year. And then below normal amount of Santa Ana wind events through the period. On average, we have eight Santa Ana or red flags that are posted a year. And I'll show a chart that gives you some uh, uh, history on the amount of Santa Ana winds we get when they're most uh, prevalent. And then we have also predicted normal fire activity. And normal fire activity um, is all inclusive of how many fires we have, whether they're large or they're small. So that's the, the probability or a fire that starts and then does spread. But we also have a matrix on we look on our high risk days um, that promotes large fire growth. And we'll get to that here shortly. So looking at our uh, drought, and this is uh, posted just at the end of the month of August, so you can see that uh, we're in a good state as far as what our, our uh, county drought looks like. And I, in the next slide, it shows a comparison when we did this presentation last year. So you can see where we were last year at this point in time, and we didn't have many large fires last year. However, we did have the right recipe to support an active fire season last year. This year, uh, we have conditional elements day to day that could support uh, an aggressive fire day. And we look at that on a daily basis um, here shortly, which I'll show you what we do to do that. So as mentioned in our local area here and reason we have Ventura in Los Angeles County because it's the Santa Monica Mountains and um, the guardians of the fire agencies in the Santa Monica Mountains exist with Ventura County, LA County and LA City Fire Department on the most part. So what this shows is a calendar year and with the blue that you see shows the number of Santa Ana conditions and then in the red is the average number of moderate to strong Santa Ana conditions. So some of our highest frequencies of our east wind or Santa Ana wind events, we do get are in January and December, yet the state of the fuels um, and or um, the precipitation that we may have had may uh, significantly suppress the probability for large fire growth. 
So if we look at Santa Ana red flag correlation in high risk days, which is highlighted in yellow, it shows October, November, and December. That's when, as we lead into October, we know that we, on routine uh, climatology in normal, that we don't have much precipitation. Um, we haven't stimulated mm -hmm. any new uh, growth. So we have a very receptive fuel bed. Our live fuel moistures are at the lowest point that they can be at during the months of October, November, and into December because of those fuels are uh, dry and dormant, even though we're trending into cooler climate and, um, and, and moisture conditions. However, when we look at Santa Ana winds, I use an analogy if you were to um, wet your hair and just walk around, it would take possibly an hour to four hours or maybe five hours to dry your hair. But if you now use the hair dryer, it would rapidly change. So if you look at the fuels under a significant Santa Ana wind that is hot and dry, the fuels respond very, very quick to that. And so that's what promulgates large fire growth because we have live fuel moistures that haven't seen moisture. We have a dead fuel bed within our dead fuels that are lying throughout the wildlands and also our live fuel moistures at a low moisture content, which is the right recipe to support aggressive and large fire growth. So the watershed uh, fuel conditions, summer and fall, they become highly supportive to start for a fire to start and spread. So along the road systems around our fire stations, you have the smoky bear sign that gives you the indice for whether today's a low day, a moderate day, a high day, very high day, or an extreme. And that's based upon weather conditions for the day on the fire that it will actually start and spread, not necessarily large fire growth. So what we know that with our dry grasses that are out there, they react in a time lag within one hour or 10 hours, depending on size. And so when we know that we get like today, you could use as an example, a cooler climate, relatively 70 degree temperatures with relative humidities at 40 to 60%, reaching 100% tonight because of the moisture and saturation of moisture that's in the air those fuels become very wet. They're mother nature sponge and they absorb uh, moisture or they give off that moisture based upon sunlight. So when we get into this time lag of these fuels during late summer into fall, that's when we know that these fuels are more receptive to support an initial fire to start and the different type of weather or climatology that's forecasted throughout the day gives us um, a benchmark for how large a fire is going to be. So with Santa Ana winds, we know that's when we have our highest risk of support large fire growth. And that really happens when we have our live fuels that are between or at or under 60% in, uh, in the fall and winter. And without the lack of green up based upon precipitation, that puts us in a high risk category when we have a wind event. All fuels need to be stimulated to moisten by precipitation and will significantly reduce large fire growth on Santa Ana wind days. So meaning that within the last um, 30 days, we received in some areas three to six inches of rain and we do see some stimulation in some new grass that comes up. So that actually is a good um, depressant, if you will, that aids in the, uh, in the fire's ability to not rapidly expand through spotting, but there still is enough continuous uh, dry fuels out there. So just because you do see that intermittent pieces of annual grasses out there doesn't put us out of um, a high risk day where we could have a potentially large fire. So what your Los Angeles County Fire Department does is we go out and measure the live fuels. So we have six distinct forecast zones in Los Angeles County 
Santa Monica Mountains being one of those. So what um, our forestry division does is they go out every two to two and a half weeks to certain sites and cut um, samples of the native vegetation that's out there. And with that, they take it and they weigh it in its um, raw form, if you will. And then they put it in an oven and cook all the moisture out of it and then weigh it again. And there's a formula that gives you a representative of how much water weight is being retained um, in that wildland um, native fuel bed. So this chart starts January 1st and goes through December. You can see that in um, the average curve from 1981 to present shows that black line and shows a historical perspective through 40 years of where live fuels are. We show the 2022 of what last year's fuels were. And then we show in the red line where we're at now. So you can see that we're um, uh, surprisingly above average and that's based upon soil moisture, which is only done in two different ways by relative humidity and that dew that falls onto the uh, fuel bed uh, in the ground to help with that saturation and or rainfall precipitation. Here I have fire activity increases with live fuel moisture at, at or less than 80%. And the why behind that is, as we know, as we start trending on that line to where we get our live fuels that are sampled, we get close to 80% is when we know that the soil moistures are drying up, your fuel bed and your grass is curing, plus the live fuels that are very mature and older um, react to daily weather values and it supports uh, fire spread very easy. And so it's a fine balance with the amount of outside air temperature, the relative humidity, the wind speed and also the fuel moistures and what their balance is on the day. But we know that we have a higher probability to have aggressive fires when our live fuel moistures get at or below 80. And as you can see in the chart, when it gets to 60%, it's relatively bone dry. And so there's not much water weight. And we know the more water weight we have in anything that we're trying to burn, um, it takes more heat energy especially in wildland fire, you need more heat energy to move it across the landscape. So the drier the fuels are, the more probable it is to have an aggressive fire. So the fire danger analysis, um, where we look every day on different portions, we look at what our annual grass component is. We know that when it's dry, it's receptive to areas with sunlight, we know that when live fuel moisture is at 80%, it will trend downward over the next several months. And that's based from today until the end of the year. If Mother Nature favors us with precipitation, that's a great thing because that'll be a, a great um, uh, suppressant for our probability of large fire growth. There's a moderate chance of probability for a frequent initial attack on routine days because we do have a dry fuel bed out there that reacts through the course of a day. Um, we have a low probability of large fire in the absence of wind in coastal areas. So if you look through 100 years worth of fire history in the Santa Monica Mountains, we have low probabilities of large fires. And those large fires that we categorize are something at 5,000 acres or greater. The average um, fire that happens in the Santa Monica Mountains on a high risk day with those east winds are 8,000 acres or greater over the first two and a half hours with the average fire size of 25,000 that start anywhere from along the 101 freeway that extend to uh, the coastline. So we identify a high risk day as dry conditions coupled with high winds and dry fuels for a 12 to 24 hour period and that could significantly contribute to a high risk day or large fire growth day. And we have a burning index matrix, which I'll show you here shortly, that we can look at the combination of these factors to see where we're at with our daily fire danger analysis. 
So what is the right recipe for a high risk day? We know that the National Weather Service has a fire weather watch or warning. We look to see where our live fuel moistures at are and you have a significant difference in high winds with live fuel moistures below 80 uh, when you're giving these really dry, hot conditions and windy conditions. Um, we look for when our fine fuel moistures are less than 7%, our 10 hour dead fuel moistures are less than 7%. We have wind speeds of 35 miles an hour or greater. And then we have a burning index matrix, which I'll show you. Um, that we can really fine tune when we have a high risk day. But one thing is to remember is our fire frequency in most cases in the Santa Monica mountains needs a human element of some sort, whether it be mechanical failure, accidental failure. We don't have fire history that shows a lot of frequency in fires with mother nature meaning lightning. With that fire regime in the Santa Monica Mountains um, doesn't support that during the fall when our conditions are the most vulnerable with our with our climatology. So this chart is what we use uh, every day. So I pulled the one up for today, and as you look uh, along the left hand column, where it says the LA Basin, the Santa Monica Mountains, Santa Cruz Valley, the High Country, Antelope Valley, and Catalina. Those are our forecast zones because the climatology, I'm sure you all could agree with that the climatology or weather is significantly different within those areas. So how do our fuels respond to that? What are the weather conditions in that area? Um, that can help us determine whether or not we have the potential for an aggressive initial attack day, but not necessarily large fire growth, or do we have a significant fire day with a high potential for large fire growth? So the aerial supports uh, shows the Santa Monica Mountains, and it says ROS, that's a mo remote automated weather station or system and we have this uh, throughout our service area. So here what we do is we utilize the data from the Chesbro Ross, Malibu Hills Ross, Beverly Hills Ross, Leo Carrillo, uh, Malibu Canyon and Topanga. And it gives also the jurisdictional engine company. We can look at what the forecasted weather is gonna be for the day. And it shows, um, at the average and, and then it shows the burning index. So the burning index for today was 54. What does 54 mean? And I'll show you that here next on what 54 means. So <clears throat> this is a, a tool we use called a pocket card and it has four distinct quadrants. Uh, upper left-hand quadrant as you're looking at your uh, screen shows the Santa Monica Mountains, it shows a dashed line that goes horizontally that shows the 97th percentile. It shows a black line that shows the highest uh, ever recorded burning index for that day. Then blue is average. And so the burning index was 54. So we know that we have average weather for the day. We have average fuel conditions for the day. So we have a relatively low probability for large fire growth. Looking at the upper right hand quadrant, this gives you the interpretation of what um, each one of those lines mean, but it also gives us local thresholds. Um, the local thresholds, so when we brief our firefighters in the morning on what the day can bring on our wildland fire risk and that fire danger element, and this is what this is, this is a fire danger element, Fire behavior is how is that fire reacting across the landscape under these weather conditions. So combinations of any of these factors can greatly increase fire behavior. 20 foot wind speeds of over 30 miles an hour, relative humidity less than 20%, temperature over 80 and a burning index over 192. So the upper left hand quadrant which shows a 54 um, it shows that we have average uh, type of weather for the day and fuel conditions. So 
doesn't mean we won't have a fire, can have a fire, just uh, the probability for large fire growth, something being in that 5,000 acres or greater is highly unlikely. The lower left-hand quadrant shows us years to remember. So we use a fire on a routine day and what it looked like, that was a Stokes fire uh, back in um, 2017. And then of course the 2018 Woolsey fire and you could use um, the, the left-hand column where it says 050, 100, 150, 200, all the way to 450. You can look at the month across the bottom and then cross it together and where they cross, it shows where the star of the Woolsey fire was. The burning index for Woolsey was at 406. So what does a 406 mean? We'll get to that here in a second, but this gives us reference through science and data for us to make an informed decision on what our relative risk is. And how this daily fire danger analysis works is that we have a communication line internally within the organization in the morning at 9.45 and now operations conference call. So we can look what our daily fire danger analysis is. We can see if there's a need to do any augmented staffing. We can see if there's a need to pre-deploy and pre-position uh, resources, whether it be aircraft, whether it be fire engines, hand crews or dozers in certain areas. And so this comes into play. Shadows on, shadows on, come again. So this comes into play when in all those forecast zones because the risk in Malibu area with a burning index of 54, you can have a, a completely different weather and fuel condition scenario in the Antelope Valley. So each one of these pocket cards are they're called are they're called are built for each specific forecast zone, and once again, there's six, and they all go through the same matrix. If you look at the um, lower right hand, this tells us what 100 years worth of fire history does. What a wind-driven fire can produce a rate of spread of over uh, two miles an hour. You can have spotting up to one to three miles ahead of the fire front. When you have eye level winds at 15 miles an hour or greater with live fuel moistures at 75% or less, a fine fuel moisture of 5% or less, this is we, what we know is the right recipe to support large fire growth. And so we don't wake up surprised. We're responding to the fire danger component rather than reacting to it. So this is one great uh, tool that we have um, in our organization through our forestry division and the interpretation through the fire uh, danger and fire behavior uh, shop that we have that gives us this relative risk every day. And then with that burning index, with it being 56, 54 to 56 for today, we would go to this matrix. So what does it mean to when we need to brief people? that we know that if we have a burning index between 50 and 149, we have low fire behavior intensity, routine weather for the area, and it also gives us spotting up to a half mile. This also, if you look at where we're at with this, key indicators are temperatures between 70 and 90, which we met for today, winds between five and 20 miles an hour, relative humidity range between 25 and 50%, um, and then our dead fuel moistures and our time lag fuels with those dead fuel moistures in our lives are in that range. Then we even give our firefighters tactical engagement options on how to suppress that fire and what to look for. And then this is an average fire size class is in older growth vegetation or something in steep topography, you would have a fire um, potentially at five to 250 acres. So in closing, a high risk day will need the combination of high winds and dry weather. Large scale winds are routinely forecast in the fall and winter months. High winds and large fire growth is dependent upon spotting ahead of an advancing fire front. The current state and forecast of climatology will support spotting. High winds and live fuel moistures near 80 will produce aggressive fire behavior on high risk days. 
the combination of these two factors will create an advancing fire problem with significant spotting. Large fire days in the months of October through December have the potential of 10,000 plus acres if they and are associated with rainfall at or less than two inches before the fire. So what we see in fire history is that if we don't have two inches of rain or greater going into our October, November, and December, until we hit that two inch mark, um, we have that vulnerable fuel bed. And we know that on average, we get eight red flags uh, per fall season. So we know we have the potential for a high risk day. So we'll have some significant challenges uh, with large fire growth. But every piece of landscape isn't considered the same. We also look at our fire history and where we have post fire areas. So meaning that we had the T Woolsey fire in 2018. So that has a different set of uh, conditions on how fire will burn across the landscape as comparatively speaking to um, if you're at Malibu Canyon at Bluffs Park transitioning all the way to Topanga that hasn't had fire frequency in quite some time. So we have a different set of vulnerabilities in those older fuel beds because the energy release that comes out of those fuel beds so it significantly um, challenges our operational ability to combat the fire. And remember with those high wind speeds that we have, that our fixed wing aircraft that we have available to us may get shut down because it's very dangerous for the pilots to fly. Plus with the altitude and the airspeed that they have to maintain, uh, it's very ineffective for using those fixed wing aircraft um, to suppress fires even challenges with our rotary wing aircraft, and that's our, our fleet of Blackhawks that we have become very challenging um, in high winds because once again, the airspeed that they have to maintain, the altitude they're at, plus the dispersal of those winds between where the aircraft is and before it hits uh, the, the burning vegetation that's on the ground has a lot of displacement and dispersion. So the efficiency of that is significantly different and low wind speeds on routine days. So with that, I'll leave it up to um, some questions and answer, uh, and I'll have some answers, I hope. Well, we can leave it open to the group if anybody has anything. If anyone has a question, go ahead and raise your hand and then we'll go through the list that way. All right, doesn't I don't see any questions. So let me see. All right, well, I don't see any questions. Uh, thank you so much for that great presentation, Chief Smith. Uh, definitely had a lot of important information. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to our public safety director, Susan Duenas, and see if she has anything she would like to add. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks, Chief Smith. Um, I, I, you know, I guess my only question is I feel like with the, the added moisture we've had recently, I feel a little more relaxed going into this season. And just tell me if I'm being a complete fool or if I have reason to be a little more relaxed than usual. It plays a role, but yet when we know that we will get a Santa Ana day, we know that we will go into a red flag and that changes everything dramatically in the course of an hour. And especially okay. our average red flag lasts for three days. And so on a fire, even though we have had cool climatology, just remember we had rain that we had with the with the hurricane that came in 
And then we had a heat wave, so everybody forgot about the hurricane because then it was 108 um, in the valley and then on the, uh, on the north end of the Santa Monica Mountains. And now we're back into routine days. So the fuel beds are still significantly vulnerable and in a high risk day changes that dramatically. So we really don't look at that we're in a safer place until we start getting those shorter daylight hours. So as we get into middle of October, that we get two inches of rain or more. So that coupled with short daylight hours, colder fuel beds, stimulation of green grass to sprout. Because when we have that green grass that sprouts, what it does is it is a good uh, deterrent for those spots, spot fires to happen ahead of an advancing fire front compared to a continuous dry fuel bed throughout. So it does play a role. So yes, we are in a good place, but we're not out of the woods. We need to um, still hope that mother nature cooperates with us and uh, turns on the sprinkler system early and gives us a dose of it throughout the year rather all at once. Looks like Kim Forster has a question. Oh, great. I think, Kim, I see if you can unmute. Yeah, I think I did. There you go. Okay. Um, so I'm just kind of curious because a lot of the conditions you referenced are all macro things that individual homeowners have no control over. So when we see that we're coming into a red flag period when we get like our weather forecast, should we be changing how we water our yards so that our... Um, vegetation adjacent to our homes gets added moisture in those periods is there anything we can do for our own personal space that helps that is a great question and yes yeah, so around your home that if you have um any time that you raise the water weight within an organic material so your wildland fuels or your ornamental vegetation um, it is a good thing. So on a day that we know we're going to have hot, dry, windy conditions, proactively could homeowners um, water uh, more robustly than they would? Um, that would not be a bad thing. That could be a, a very good thing uh, to do to raise the water weight in those dead uh, materials of the leaf litter or pine needles or whatever it may be. Uh, around your home that all is a is a decent practice to do so but do you just do the added watering the day of or if i if i know in like the five day forecast you know it's monday it's going to be bad wednesday should i start watering extra monday tuesday and wednesday or just wait till wednesday and do it uh you well it's only going to take in so much water weight as it is so um, as you trend into that high risk day, yes, you can, um, if we're allowed to amplify our watering, <laughs> I don't know what restrictions are in place right now. We all get lost in that. So um, I would suggest that yes, you could do it trending into that day. So you know that you have um, wetted material around your home. So if it was me, I would tend to be uh, very uh, on the state of being conservative of, of watering throughout up to the time and through the, the time period that it is um, forecast for those hot, dry, windy days. It won't be just a one and done that you watered it because if you watered it on Tuesday and the, and the high risk day comes in on Thursday with the amount of wind and dry uh, fuel conditions, it would all be forgotten. Okay, so I was trying to figure out. Thank you. You bet. That's a great really great question, Kim. I'm glad you asked that. And especially helpful, I guess, for everyone who hopefully has drip irrigation. So if it's windy, the water's not being blown away. <laughs> um, wow, anybody else? No. I don't see any additional hands raised. Um, so if there's anything else that uh, Chief Smith or Susan, you would like to add? 
No, I just want to thank you so much, Chief. As always, you really are so informative. Um, we're so lucky to have you with all your knowledge on this. So it's, it's helpful to hear what you have to say every year. Um, so it sounds like in some, we're not out of the woods yet. We can't let our guard down. Water your yard when a red flag is forecasted and hope for the best. Yes, I agreed. And just thank you to your staff and especially the fire safety liaison. So I work with routinely to communicate the correct information and messaging. And just one thing, if I can leave with something is just on the messaging. A couple things we want to be cognizant of is valid information that you know that you have valid information in, in case there is a wildland fire that use <clears throat> valid information sources and how it comes from the incident is posted to the cooperators, whether it be the city office of emergency management. And so use credible information to make your family decision. Please look at our website for the ready, set, go, be prepared, be ready, be set. And when there's an evacuation order, put time on your side and evacuate early because what we find is people evacuate late um, can be challenged um, because they've run out of time and then it impacts what we need to do. It also could potentially impact their livelihood and their life safety. So practice at your home, communicate at your home and please go to our website. And I know the city of Malibu, we've done a lot of public information on Ready, Set, Go and how that looks. So please be prepared. That's all I have. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Yeah, thank you so much. And don't forget your pets too, because sometimes I know sometimes people don't plan as well as they should for their pets by having the proper trailers or crates or whatever you're going to need. Make sure you get that all in place before you need it. Agreed. Yep. All, all right. right. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Chief Smith. Uh, thank you for everyone attending our first speaker in our uh, speaker series event. Our next speaker will be this Thursday. It's our City of Malibu Fire Safety Liaisons, uh, and they will be speaking about home hardening and fire safe, uh, fire wise communities. Um, so with that being said, thank you so much, and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you, thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you everybody who tuned in.